वेलकम ऑल आई होप यू आर हैविंग गुड टाइम इन द कॉन्फ्रेंस वाइल लर्निंग फ्रॉम ईच अदर इट्स एक्साइटिंग टू मीट एंड टॉक टू यू यू नो थ्रू द बूथ्स एंड वन ऑन वन इवेंट्स यू नो लर्निंग अबाउट न्यू यूज केसेस एंड न्यू फ्रेमिंग ऑफ प्रॉब्लम्स एवरी डे I am Raja Loganathan I am a engineering manager with Google Cloud Storage I have Subhashish and Frank from Google Cloud as well we also have Sai from one of our storage partners Cohesity Today I would like to talk about building systems that are security by design and default using Google Cloud Storage We work with a lot of customers from different market segments so I'd like to take some time to talk about the industry trend that we see with security and storage one of the main theme that you have been hearing through this conference is how cloud is democratizing the special powers for engineers and in our industry you don't have to be one of those few companies in the world who get to use a storage system with 11/9 of durability irrespective of whether you're a startup or a big enterprise company you have access to such a storage system if that's what you need to make your business successful so today let's explore this theme little bit more in the context of security and scalability to make my case i would like to start off with an analogy as many of you might know this is jacques cousteau he pioneered the modern day marine conservation he has traveled to the remote corners of the earth to study coral reef system and other sea life and in order to be underwater he co-developed the first open circuit breathing apparatus that evolved into the modern day regulators he has had a tremendous influence in this field well thanks to his influence i picked up diving as my hobby and you know diving took me to different parts of the world here is a map of many of the coral reefs where i have spent days diving many of these reefs are in pristine condition teeming with life now let me step back I didn't have to be a Jacques Cousteau or a full-time marine researcher to experience these amazing sights and build that sense of appreciation. What is making it possible for a common man like me? Number one, we have resilient regulators. They are robust that I can put it in my garage and I can use it when I need it. Number two, no matter which corner of the earth I go, there are universal safety standards. Even in today's world, diving can be pretty dangerous if not for those safety standards number 3 this is more important we have reached a critical mass of community to support diving when you think about our industry we have a similar trend going on you have access to a planet scale blob storage system and as i've been saying it provides 11/9 of durability whether you want to store your few mb photo or if you are an animation movie studio wanting to store terabytes of movie file you can store it here you can store exabytes of data if you are thinking about cost we have a range of option from hot to cold storage if you are streaming music the time to first byte is going to be in milliseconds and even if it is a cold storage the response time is going to be in milliseconds as opposed to hours or days here are some of our customers on how they use google cloud storage customers use multi regional option for content storage and delivery and customers go with big data the regional option for big data analytics and customers use nearline or coline for backup archival purposes we also have storage partners such as cohesity who offer google cloud storage as one of the options let me go back to the scalability theme when you are thinking about the theory of constraints for your business you are no longer worried about building some complex distributed system now the focus has shifted to architecting the right system for your business so let me ask all of you a question for the systems that you are running for your business from a scalability standpoint what are the trade offs you are making what failure modes are you worried about what bottlenecks are you worried about now i know most of you are going to give me a good set of answers because as a industry we have done an effective job in disseminating scalability patterns and thanks to cloud the cognitive load to think about these patterns are also substantially less now start thinking about 
security, I'll get to it in a second. We are seeing example where within a company, two teams going with completely different architecture with different storage solution. This was almost unimaginable 10, 15 years when your organization picked one storage solution or the other. Effectively, our organization and our systems are becoming a starfish. Starfish has this interesting neural structure where if it loses an arm, it's going to regrow it. In fact, starfish can shed an arm as a defense mechanism because it knows it can regrow. So what about security? With security, what we are seeing is we are still stuck in the traditional model of having a single watchdog team for your entire organization. With the pace of innovation, the velocity of changes that are going on, and the sheer complexity of the systems that you're running, by the way, the complexity is not going to go down. Having this traditional model is just not scalable. Our organizations and our systems have to become a starfish from a security standpoint as well. We have to emulate the success that we have created with scalability. Security is the new scalability. So in order to effectively disseminate security ideas, patterns are a very good mechanism for you to have good conversations with your team to make intentional choices and build security at every layer. So in the next few slides, let's talk about some of the security patterns that we commonly see among our customers. The first thing with security is people. When you're thinking of scalability, we mostly think in terms of systems. But with security, people play an equal role. As I've been saying, with the growing complexity, there are often interesting interplay between people and system. So for you to have good security, you know, there has to be intentional architecting for people and system. To talk about the next couple of pattern, let me set up a scenario. Let's say you are a financial company with multiple research teams. Let's say these research teams are operating on a common data set. The data set is particularly not sensitive. Let's say it's a public data set. But the results being produced by your research team is what is providing you the competitive advantage in the market. They are extremely sensitive that you don't even want to share among other teams. And let's say you also have a team of analysts who are looking at these results to make decisions on behalf of your business. So using that scenario, let's talk about this first pattern. This is the confused deputy pattern. This is the case when there is ambiguous definition of responsibility or authority. So in our scenario, let's say the researcher found some interesting results and want to share with his team. He can go to our Google Cloud Storage Console and hit that Share Publicly button to provide reader access to his team. But that action is not only providing reader access to his organization or his team, he's providing reader access to the entire public internet. So this, this is not even a bad actor scenario. This is good actor with good intentions, but still the consequences are not what you desire. By the way, we are revamping this console experience too to make it better. So to tactically solve that problem, the first thing you have to take care is you have to like define the roles. We have predefined roles, for example, in this scenario, for the researcher, maybe you can go with a creator role where they can create objects but not necessarily modify permissions. If you're not happy with the predefined roles, we have IAM custom roles that you can create with customized set of permissions. But still, this is too contextual, too tactical. There are a lot of storage permissions, as you can see here. So is there a way to solve this problem at a higher granularity? So let's talk about this next pattern, privilege separation pattern. Let's say you're using Google KMS to encrypt data in cloud storage. Now you have two sets of permissions that you can operate with. For example, analysts at a higher granularity can think about which projects have which access. So now, no matter what the storage permissions are, people cannot read the object without the decrypt permission. Let's zoom out even further. If you set up a virtual private network across your resources in Google Cloud, across your buckets, objects, Google Compute Engine, other, and other services, now irrespective of any permission, none of that data is going to get out of that perimeter that you have set up. 
All right, let's switch gear. Let's uh, talk about some encryption patterns. The first one is the key wrapping pattern. This is super useful to solve encryption problem at scale and to solve problem like zero anonymization for sensitive information such as credit card number. To illustrate this example, I would like to use an example from within our system on how we use this pattern inside of Google Cloud Storage. Let's say you use KMS to store an object in, in our service. When we get the object, the first thing we do is chunk them. This is to make sure we use our own infrastructure effectively. The naive approach here is going to be take all of those chunks, send it over to KMS, get it encrypted, get it back, and then store them. It is pretty ineffective because of the data going all around. And from a performance profile, it's not going to be acceptable for you. Instead, what we do is we generate a local encryption key for each one of those chunks. And then after encrypting the chunks, we take those local encryption key, send it over to KMS, get it encrypted, get it back, and then store it in our system, which effectively achieves the same purpose. You could also use this example for the zero anonymization. Let's say you're storing files in cloud storage with sensitive information such as social security number, credit card number. Instead of sending the whole file over to KMS, you could use a local encryption key to anonymize those information and then send that local key to over to KMS, get it encrypted. Okay, let's talk about this next pattern, crypto shredding pattern. In order to provide the best possible customer experience, you are trying to solve all kinds of cool problems for your customers. Let's say you take the data stored in your bucket, move it to BigQuery to do some analytics, then take the data further to do some more analysis to provide that additional value for your customer. But what is happening is the customer data is getting proliferated. When the time comes to delete, deletion, you want to effectively delete the entire footprint to maintain trust with your customer, and sometimes to meet regulations like GDPR. So in such scenarios, this pattern could potentially be useful. Let's say you're using Google KMS. You can use the same key across different Google services. Now, as soon as you get rid of the key, then all of the data are effectively meaningless, and then you can go around cleaning them up later. But from a customer point of view, you have you know, effectively deleted the data. We adopt a similar approach within Google Cloud Storage too. The first thing we focus on is getting rid of those encryption keys is to make all of those chunks meaningless, and then we go do the garbage collection. The last pattern I want to talk about is the privilege revocation pattern. In the previous pattern, we talked about how to effectively delete the data. In this pattern, let's talk about how to effectively not delete the data. I'm not joking here. There are valid scenarios. Let's say you're a financial industry. Then you're required to keep some data for X number of years. In those cases, you can basically revoke access from a deletion standpoint. And then no matter who you are in your organization, you can't delete the data. Google Cloud will keep it for the X number of years that you have specified. And then it will open up the access back to you so that you can delete it. By the way, that image over there is not a jail. Before your imaginations run wild, that's Fort Knox where the gold is stored. Next, I would like to invite Subhashish to talk about the GCS security primitives that you get. So as Raja said, uh, security is the new scalability. Uh, Security is something which is at the heart of our design as far as GCS in particular and Google Cloud Storage and Google Cloud uh, platform in general is concerned. Security is not something that we think of something that can be an afterthought that you can bolt on later. It is something that you have to uh, plan for and design at every layer of your stack. So when our uh, users use Google Cloud Storage or in general when they use Google Cloud, there are lots of special powers with regards to security that they get, right? So according to third party estimates, uh, Google's private network is probably the largest private network out there in the world. It has thousands of uh, edge nodes. It has hundreds of pop nodes. You know, as a customer, you are never too far away from a Google uh, point of presence. 
Now, this has a tremendous security advantage for our customers as well, right? So what happens is, say your data is stored in a particular region, but you are accessing the data from a different city, or you are writing to that data from a different city. Now, with any other uh, cloud storage provider out there, what would happen is the data would take the public internet to the region where the data is stored. Uh, with GCS, what happens is we actually get your data through the nearest POP. So say if you're writing from New York City, we'll actually get the data into Google's private network through the POP in New York City, and you might be actually writing your data to Europe, right? So this has tremendous benefits in terms of performance. It has tremendous benefits in terms of cost because you are not paying egress charges you know, for public internet traversal. But most importantly, this has also tremendous benefit in terms of security, because what happens is your data is traversing through the private network of Google for as much time as possible, thereby minimizing exposure in public internet, right? Uh, now, encryption is something which is at the core of security considerations as well, right? So with GCS, all your data is always encrypted. We have multi -layer of, multiple layers of encryption uh, for GCS data. Your data is encrypted at the data layer. It is encrypted at the storage and media layer, right? Uh, there are some public cloud storage providers with whom default encryption is an option, right? We fundamentally don't believe in that. Personally speaking, I find the sentence where you have you know, default encryption option it seems to me an oxymoronic statement, right? So we fundamentally believe as a platform that all your data should always be encrypted, right? Now, encryption at rest is fine. What about encryption in flight? All of your GCS data is also encrypted in flight. The only exceptions we have are for multi-cloud use cases where you might be writing to another cloud storage, which is not encrypted by default, right? For example, for S3 compatibility, we do support uh, unencrypted modes of uh, you know, data, data movement in flight. But for all of your native GCS data, it is always encrypted in flight. Now, in addition to encryption, what is also very important is how do you manage the encryption, right? How do you actually manage the keys which are encrypting your data? So I often talk to some customers from highly regulated industries uh, with a high security sensitivity, sensitivity. They say, you know, Shubhashi, everything you say is great, but I cannot really store my encryption key with you. My dictates are such that I need to store the encryption key on my premises or on my HSM, right? So GCS allows for that as well. You do not have to store your encryption keys with us. You just supply it to us during the time you write the data or you read the data or you do any metadata operation. So we fully support customer supplied encryption key as well, right? So along with encryption, another very key component of your security considerations is auditing. For regulatory compliance, auditing is very important. For even you, forget re regulatory co compliance, even from your perspective, if you have to ensure things are working the way they're supposed to and access is the way it is, you need to ensure that you have solid audits in place, right? So as a platform and as a product, we believe in giving you a lot of choice, right? So with GCS, as far as auditing is concerned, you can go for multiple options here. You can go for cloud audit logging, which is a platform-wide log logging capability. So whether it is administrative activity or it is data access uh, audit logging, you can get it through cloud audit logging. Now, if you want to really dig deep and you want to find out at a very fine granularity that per object, you know, what's the kind of latency I'm getting? What is the kind of data storage patterns that I have? Or how is my object lifecycle management behaving per object level, right? If you are interested in that kind of detail, then you can also go for GCS access and storage logs. And then finally, from a compliance and regulatory perspective, if you want to consume these logs, and if you want to pipe them into your uh, you know, pipelines, your audit uh, systems, uh, deployment architectures, you can use tag driver monitoring, which gives you programmatic access to this audit logging information as well, right? So again, in many conversations when I travel across the world and I speak to you know, new customers or prospects, they ask me, okay, Shubhashish, all that is great, but you know, I come from healthcare industry, unless you talk HIPAA, unless you are HIPAA compliant, I can't really use you. So not only we are HIPAA compliant, as you can see, we are a platform with rich third party uh, audits and certifications. We are SOC compliant, we are ISO compliant, uh, we are PCI level three compliant, and we are FedRAMP ATO compliant as well. So we are an enterprise platform, and we take care of the fact that uh, whatever level of auditing and certification you need to be with us, it would be there. 
So in today's world, PII, or personally identifiable information, is a very important topic right now. It's very topical because it's very sensitive in nature and it's the center stone. So PII, or personally identifiable information, is the center stone for, uh, you know, around which a lot of regulations such as GDPR is formulated, right? So GDPR is live even as we speak. There are several other uh, regulations which are also in the process of being formulated, which all center around how do you handle PII, right? So in our platform, we have Data Loss Prevention APIs, DLP, which allows you to effectively redact, encrypt, pseudo-anonymize, and for you to get a very good grip on how your PII is, right? So it allows you to analyze your PII, it allows you to visualize your PII, and effect, you know, effectively manage your PII. So one use case, one customer use case that I share, that I can share with you is the following. So say you are a financial organization or you are a bank, and you want to ingest your data into GCS as a data lake, and you want to run uh, big data analytics, and you want to uh, understand analytic patterns for your data. But the challenge that you face, you know, working with the public cloud is, okay, what do I do with my PII? Because there might be so many credit card information, you know, first name, last name, email ID, age, social security number, and so on, right? So this is where DLP comes into place. You ingest your data in GCS, you run DLP over it, DLP completely pseudo anonymizes, redacts all the data. Even if you want, and then you can actually go ahead with BigQuery and you can analyze the data. And when the time comes and you want to pipe the data out of the system and move it back to say on-prem, you can use DLP to encrypt uh, data as it egresses the public cloud, right? So this allows you to completely leverage the power of Google Cloud and at the same time ensure that you do not sacrifice or compromise uh, your PII at all. So these are all the existing special powers that Google Cloud as a platform and cloud storage as a product gives you. Uh, but that's not all we are here to speak about today. It gives me a lot of joy to talk about the new features that we are announcing here publicly uh, today. For the whole last year or so, our team has been busy working with our customers to closely understand the problems that they face uh, and, and really solve high value problems so that we can continue to work effectively uh, in this new world. The first feature I want to announce today is access transparency with GCS. This integration is going general availability and this should be available for general public consumption pretty soon. Maybe as soon as uh, you know, this uh, event is over, maybe as soon as next week. So with access transparency, the main problem that we are solving is if you want to know who it is that has access to your data. So this who could be a Googler who's, say, SRE. And, uh, you know, the SRE might have uh, access to your data because, say, a hurricane was headed towards uh, your data center. Or maybe you raised a ticket and you said, hey, I want you to move this data from this location to that because this sets me up for better performance. Now, from a compliance and regulatory perspective, what you want to have is a very clean you know, trail of who has accessed my data, what is the location from which this data has been accessed, who is this person, why has this person moved my data, what is the justification, right? So access transparency gives you all this information and it is also available through stack driver monitoring for you to programmatically integrate with your uh, systems, right? The second feature uh, that I am announcing today is going GA, and this is again a feature which should be available probably as soon as next week. We are actually in the process of rolling out the GA changes for this. It's a bunch of uh, security and privacy UI enhancements, and uh, to, to tell you the problem why, why we are doing this, right? So over last year, last year and a half, across different public cloud services, we, you know, we heard from our customers uh, who were using some other services, they said that one problem that they faced is they didn't have a very good handle on what part of their data is public and what part of their data, data sets are private, right? So inadvertently, they ended up overexposing their data. And in some cases, uh, they were like taken hostage of because you know, the sharing model was not really very safe. There are various solutions with Google Cloud Platform that you don't run into this kind of a problem, like VPC, is a major step towards the direction. But you may say, you know what, VPC is a big sledgehammer for me. I don't want to use VPC. Can you give me something simpler? So we are doing this UI enhancements where 
in your GCS browser, you can very clearly see which of your buckets are public, which of your objects are public, right? And uh, like the uh, confused deput deputy access pattern that Raja mentioned, where you could be sharing the data publicly, thinking public means you know, your company publicly, not public internet. So with these new UI changes, even if you were under a wrong impression as to what your blast radius was, you can't really do this because we now have a IAM panel-based interaction and through this IAM panel-based interaction, you would be setting permissions on your data sets. So there is absolutely no way, no way that by accident or inadvertently you would be sharing this data with public internet. The third feature I'm announcing today uh, publicly is Cloud KMS. Uh, some of you, uh, some of GCS customers are actually testing this even as we speak uh, because this is in public beta. Uh, what Cloud KMS gives is, you know, to describe what is the common problem that we hear from our customers is they want fine granular access to, or they want fine granular manageability of their keys. Like, I should be able to create my key, delete my key, rotate my key. I should be able to set automatic rotation schedule for my key. I should be able to disable a key and so on. But the main challenge they face is hosting a key management service, ensuring that the key management service is always on, is very highly available. It can be very challenging. Like what happens due to a hardware failure or due to some error, you actually lose a key, an encryption key you might actually lose access to petabytes of information, right? So what Cloud KMS does for you is, cloud, with Cloud KMS, Google hosts the key for you. Google ensures that the key is always available for you in every single region with the latency and availability that you want, but you still retain all the ability to have very fine granular management for your encryption keys. And uh, with this GCS integration, you get the same SLA in terms of availability and uh, durability and performance uh, that is there with GCS even if you did not use uh, Cloud KMS. Because as I, as I said, all data in GCS is always encrypted. Either you use Cloud KMS and manage the keys yourself or Google would automatically manage it for you, right? So Cloud KMS is in public beta right now. I invite you guys to actually test it out. And as with all other features, uh, uh, Cloud KMS is also available programmatically. Now, we briefly alluded to VPC before. VPC was a very highly requested feature for quite a long time. A lot of customers were used to sharing patterns and you know network firewalls in their private infrastructure. But the challenge with public cloud they faced is the moment they come to public cloud, their existing sharing patterns may be a little riskier, right? Uh, so what VPC allows you to do is to have a network firewall and for you to have an environment where as if you have your own private cloud within public cloud, right? So with VPC, you can say, okay, this is my security access zone, this is my secure access zone rather, and in this secure access zone, I put a few services. Like you can say, okay, these are my GC instances, this is my GCS uh, service, and you know, this is my BigQuery, and these are the services which should be able to talk to each other. By doing this, you ensure that your data cannot be exfiltrated to any other service. Additionally, what you can also do is, you can say, okay, these are the on-prem IP addresses which I am whitelisting, right? So this extends the hybrid uh, security access patterns to the public cloud and gives you your own firewall. So this is a very, very strong security primitive. We are announcing private beta for VPC service controls and we invite you to te test this feature and get a chance to shape it as it goes into production GA, right? So last but not the least, today is the first time, it gives me a lot of joy that this is the first time we are announcing bucket lock in early access program for GCS customers. So what bucket lock is, is basically warm storage, right? Warm stands for write once, read many times. It is also traditionally, classically uh, called as uh, retention lock, right? So the use case is this. Say uh, you are a finance company, you have to conform to FINRA, SEC, or CFTC, uh, CFTC regulation, or you are in movie archive business, or you are doing general backup and archive. And you need to ensure that all your data has a certain retention. So once I write data, say your retention length is five years, and once you have set that retention period, during these five years, it should not be possible for anybody, including me, to delete this data or to modify this data, right? Warm storage is the solution for this kind of a use case. With GCS's bucket log, 
It applies across all our storage classes. Unlike other cloud services out there, it's not just for our coldest storage tier. You can use uh, bucket lock across any storage tier in GCS. And you can use the same APIs. We are just introducing two new operations. One is you know, set retention policy. The second is lock the retention policy. Uh, but that's it. You can use all the existing uh, new APIs. And uh, in addition to you know, the basic fundamental WAM capabilities, we are also supporting temporary hold and event hold, which are a little more advanced features. I'll give you a couple of small examples. Temporary hold example is, uh, say, uh, your uh, company is getting audited for two weeks or three weeks, right? Only during that time you want to ensure that you have retention lock set. That is your use case for temporary hold. An event-based hold example would be, say, you are a company who's in the business of selling mortgages or loans. So you want to let the mortgage period or the loan period play out. And after that, for FINRA, you still want to hold on to uh, you know, that client's mortgage records for another five years. This is an example of event-based hold, right? So I would invite all of you to test out this feature as well. And with that, I would invite my fr uh, friend, uh, Frank, to give you guys a demo for these new features. Thanks, Subhashish. Hi, everyone. I'm Frank. I am an engineer in developer relations that focuses on the Google Cloud Storage developer experience. Uh, today, I will be covering uh, three special powers that Google Cloud Platform provides you. And to give uh, this demo context, I'd like you to take a look at this slide. So I'm working with this fictional financial institution, uh, they, and they have a credit card support team uh, that has a chat support. That ch those chat support conversation logs are then stored into Google Cloud Storage. OK, so with this context, let's jump in. Uh, can we switch to the demo, please? Thank you. So the first special power I want to talk about is, uh, let's say that you, uh, or at least for this, uh, for this demo, um, <coughs> We want to manage the, uh, the life cycle of the encryption keys that are used for the objects or the conversations that are logged within this bucket. So what we're going to take a look at first is customer managed encryption keys. To get started, we need to create a new KMS key. So I'll, to do that, we need to create a key. So I'm going to name it credit card support te team key ring. This will hold the key. And I'll select a location of US Central 1. Click Create. Next, I'll create the key, similar uh, name, support team key. And the rotation period is how often a new version of this key is created. I'll keep these as default for now and cr uh, click Create. All right. Cool. So if we, uh, we have created a KMS key. So next, we're going to create a GCS bucket using this uh, key for customer managed encryption key. So let's go over to the Google Cloud Storage browser. Click Create Bucket. So I'm going to follow a similar pattern, credit card support team logs. And I'm going to select a regional location. At this time, you must co-locate your KMS key ring and your GCS bucket. So I'm also going to select US Central 1. Below, you'll notice that we've added uh, show advanced settings. Uh, we have, by default, Google Managed Keys. But I'm going to use Customer Managed Keys for this demo. A new uh, dropdown shows up. I can now select the KMS key that I just created. And a little message pops up. This tells me that GCS does not have the necessary permissions uh, to act on our behalf to use this KMS key to encrypt and decrypt objects. So I'm going to uh, give it the necessary permissions by clicking Grant. OK, and now I can click Create. All right, I'm going to uh, test upload a, a file to see how this all works. Um, I have here a support team conversation. Um, and I'm just going to upload this. Not that good. And click Finish. All right. Over to the right, you'll notice that uh, encryption type, uh, the encryption type is customer managed key. And if you highlight over that, it'll tell you the information as to which key is being used to encrypt this object. So over the life cycle of your bucket, even if you change the KMS key that you're using, you'll always know which key um, is being used to encrypt which object. OK. So with this, speci uh, with this special power, one thing I'd uh, like to recall is Raja mentioning about uh, the pattern crypto shredding. So let's say that I need to perform a, a mass deletion of data within a short period of time. 
this uh, potentially could be a large task, uh, which may take longer than the period of time you have to delete this information. But now that we're, we have customer managed keys, you can do this operation uh, by just doing a crypto shred, which effectively destroys the KMS key that's encrypting uh, these objects, invalidating the data that's in GCS. So let's take a look at how to do that. Let's go back to security, cryptographic keys. All right, click that. All right, in order to do this, I'm going to uh, destroy all key version material. That will start that, and I need to type this in, copy paste that schedule destruction. The first thing it does is it disables the key from being used for uh, future encryption or decryption. And the second thing it does is it schedules it for destruction. And it takes about 24 hours for that key to be destroyed. OK, let's go back to the DCS bucket. All right, so now that we've, uh, disa uh, we've uh, disabled the key, what we can now do is I'll show you an example of what happens when uh, you try to access that object again. So. By accessing this object, um, we see the uh, GCS is no, uh, no longer able to uh, decrypt the object. So it will show this mess error message whenever you try to attempt to access the object. It's uh, Cloud KMS key is disabled or destroyed. OK, so that's the first special power. Moving on to the second, uh, the second special power. All right, so let's say I want to keep these conversations safe uh, from being deleted by accidentally or uh, modified in any way. The next thing I'm going to talk about is bucket lock. Here's, uh, I'm going to cover a brief preview of the UI changes that are coming to the storage browser um, in order for you to set a retention policy for your bucket. As you can see, we've, uh, there will be a new uh, tab for the retention policy. And I can now set a, a, sh a retention policy within certain different units of time. I'm going to use seconds for the sake of this demo and set it to 10 seconds. Click save. Two uh, new lines come up. Locked and un uh, the lock state is unlocked, so I can still modify and remove this retention policy. And the effective time is when this uh, policy took effect. Let's go over back to the objects, and I'll try to upload the same conversation that we did before. Okay, close that, and I will try to delete it before 10 seconds are up. All right, cool. Um, so as you can see here, it's uh, forbidden that I can uh, I cannot delete this object at this time. So bucket lock has removed the necessary permissions that I need in order to delete this object. After 10 seconds, or the time frame that you've set in this retention policy, you should be able to delete it. And you can automate this process with, life, uh, with object lifecycle management if you, do, if you wish to do so. OK. And the last thing I want to cover uh, is uh, uh, the last special power. So, let, so these conversations that are held with this credit card support team um, they need to verify the, the, the customer that they're speaking with. So there's most likely PII in this conversation. But in, for all intents and purposes, you're most likely going to, or at least we're just going to use, use it for quality, and, uh, quality assurance, just to make sure the customer's happy. And we don't need that PII to verify that, that the customer's happy. So I'm going to cover uh, a DLP demo. OK, so let's take a look at this, uh, this short uh, little conversation here. As you can see, it's, it's between a customer and a cus uh, customer support team member. As I scroll down some more, uh, you'll notice that uh, a lot more PII was provided than necessary to verify the information or verify this customer. Uh, so we'd like to use DL a data loss prevention API to go ahead and redact this information. So I'm going to click end chat, uh, which will then start the process. OK, that happens sometimes. So I have this new one. Cool. <laughs> um, OK, so you can see over to your right, um, it has redacted um, the PIF from the conversation, which then can be stored in GCS. And as you can see, it does it for images as well. OK, with that, can we switch back to the slides, please? Thank you. With that, I would like to invite Subashis back up to the stage uh, to hear from one of our partners. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. So I invite all of you to you know, participate in uh, various stages of... Uh, sorry, yeah. So with that, I invite all of you to participate in various stages of testing, whether it's beta or early access, and, and try out these features and get a chance to shape how these features turn out during their GA time. With that, I would like to introduce uh, my friend, uh, Sai, who is from product management at Cohesity. He will talk about his experiences of partnering with Google Cloud Storage and also share with you uh, experiences from his own customers using Google Cloud Storage.
Thanks, Subhashish. Uh, so first of all, uh, you know, thanks to the Google team for uh, extending an invite to be part of this session. Really excited to be here. Um, so like, as, like uh, Subhashish said, I'm from uh, Cohesity. I'm in the product management team there. And over the next several minutes, uh, what I'm going to try and cover is give you a little bit sense of you know, how Google Cloud Storage and Cohesity partner together. But more importantly, also talk about it in the context of a real customer example uh, in terms of you know, how they integrate both Cohesity and, uh, and um, GCS. Right? So with that, um, just a quick background in terms of what uh, Cohesity is about. Um, so Cohesity is uh, a, a technology startup here, right here in Silicon Valley, uh, and with the mission of uh, redefining what we call a secondary storage. Um, so if you look at um, just data in general, you have uh, obviously your um, mission critical primary environments, um, but what we see is there is a lot more growth in uh, what we refer to as secondary storage. And that refers to backup, uh, test dev, disaster recovery, um, because of the fact that you know, for every primary data set, there are multiple copies of that data that exists today with the incumbent solutions. Um, so the first challenge that um, we have with customers is in the aspect of backup and recovery, which is referred to as data protection, that's where the Cohesity Google partnership really comes into play. So what you see here is on the left, we have um, the Cohesity uh, data platform, as we call it, which is uh, a scale-out um, on-premise solution in this case uh, that can integrate seamlessly with uh, Google Cloud Storage, with any class of Google Cloud Storage as a matter of fact, you know, whether it's regional, multi-regional, near line, and, um, and cold line as well. So the idea here is uh, with the data platform that we have on premise, um, customers can then you know, easily set policies. And uh, again, everything that we do is policy-based, API-driven architecture. So customers can set policies to manage their backups, retention policies, um, and then you know, extend it to leverage the GCS offering uh, for really long-term retention. So what you see here is, um, in this example, customers uh, typically you know, back up the data on premise, uh, and then the policies will seamlessly move that data into uh, GCS. And in this case, Cohesity manages that uh, retention both on premise as well as uh, in, the, in, in uh, Google Cloud, right? To extend this a little bit, uh, we also have an offering which we can run within the GCP platform. Um, and we call that uh, the Cohesity Data Platform Cloud Edition. So um, like uh, Subhashish uh, alluded to, you know, more and more workloads are also uh, you know, born in the cloud these days. Right? And so backup, data recovery, and data protection becomes a critical aspect of it, not only for your on-premise, but also within the workloads running in uh, GCP. So that's where cloud edition comes into play. Um, so in a similar vein, you can now set up policies uh, to back up your infrastructure running in GCP onto the Cloud Edition platform. And that um, you know, Cloud Edition actually runs on the compute infrastructure, GCE. Uh, it uses uh, uh, disks, persistent disks. And then the, uh, GCS can be an extension of those uh, persistent uh, disks that, that are there in the, in the Google Cloud. The benefits uh, to customers in general, uh, I would say broadly, you know, three things. Uh, one is uh, the simplicity and ease of use uh, that we bring uh, to the table in terms of backup and recovery. Uh, the second is the scalability of the solution. So obviously, when we are talking uh, the scale of GCP, then you know the, off the offering that we have uh, is also, it also needs to be scalable. Um, so that's the second aspect of it, the fact that we can scale both on-premise as well as in the cloud with more of uh, a grow, uh, sort of a pay-as-you-grow model, right? As your needs grow, you can keep adding more and more of uh, the Cohesity solution. And last but not the least uh, is the security, right? The fact that we, encrypt, uh, we can en leverage the encryption that Google offers, um, and then when it's on-premise, uh, the data is again encrypted uh, and uh, and uh, in flight as well, uh, and then tying it in with uh, the VPC elements uh, that uh, Subhashish brought up. 
So in order to do that, let me actually illustrate that with uh, a real customer example with one of our mutual customers. So this is a large um, semiconductor manufacturer uh, right here actually in the, in the Bay Area. And the, their uh, use case is broadly twofold. One is uh, they have, um, they continue to have more of a hybrid environment, some on-premise as well as new workloads in uh, GCP. And they want, they're looking for a data protection offering uh, that can do both, right? Uh, while also leveraging uh, GCS. So what they started off with is deploy the Cohesity platform on-premise. Um, and uh, in, in fact, they have grown that uh, over uh, the last several months. Uh, and then for the long-term retention, send the data on a policy-based schedule to uh, Google Cloud Storage, right? So that's where uh, they started with. As an extension for their workloads running within GCP, they are now using our data platform Cloud Edition um, in uh, a VPC that's been defined. And the reason they leverage uh, the VPC and, and IAM concepts that Raja talked about is they have several different product uh, projects within GCP, uh, basically various different teams uh, and also uh, acquisitions that have happened over time, resulting in a number of uh, GCP projects. So they manage all this through uh, the VPC and IAM roles. Uh, and in the backup recovery context, IAM roles are even more significant because uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, managing just the administrative tasks, you can have one role. Uh, but in, in order to provide self-service capability back to the end users, uh, you want them to have the ability to recover their virtual machines, their files. Uh, and so there are various different roles uh, created in order to facilitate self-service recovery as well. So again, it ties in back to the VPC and IAM security constructs. And the last element um, I will add is uh, we are also excited uh, to be, you know, um, a technology partner with Google on the bucket lock aspect, right? Um, uh, this is something that uh, not only this customer is looking for, uh, but also several of our mutual customers. Uh, so we are excited to be, uh, you know, playing a role in that. And it directly ties in well with, again, the, uh, the retention use case. Now they can not only manage uh, the retention aspects, both within Cohesity as well as GCS, but customers can now leverage the worm functionality to, to you know, comply with legal hold and other compliance uh, regulations. Um, so with that, uh, you know, again, great to be here. Uh, we have a booth here um, in, um, uh, at next, so please visit our booth for more information. And uh, thanks for having us, Subhashish. Thanks, Ai. So to conclude, I would like to reiterate that security is at the heart of our design. Uh, you can see it from the amount of engineers we have dedicated to security, the amount of investment we do for security, the amount of cutting edge research papers which are coming out of Google every year, and the number of custom silicons we are innovating every year in the field of security to ensure that your data is indeed safe with Google, right? So security is something we take very seriously. As Diane mentioned, security is the number one uh, worry for uh, our customers who are moving to public cloud. We want to ensure with Google it's not a worry anymore. Uh, we are, as you, as you witnessed it in our session today, we are continuing to innovate and along with all the special powers we have at this point and all the new features we continue to build, we are giving you every single tool and feature you need to have systems which are secure by design and default. Thank you.